Good morning. Let's be standing for our opening song this morning. Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon Good morning, church family. Uh, whether you are here in person or joining us online, it's uh, truly a blessing and great uh, to be together this morning, so welcome. Uh, just a few uh, announcements and family news before we continue with our worship uh, this morning. Please don't forget to take your communion cups with you. Uh, there are trash cans located at the exits of the auditorium. And then also, please take note of the two QR codes like, located on the order of worship handout. One will help you connect to us by filling out an online form, and the other is to get access to the entire bulletin that is online. Uh, we do have a new member introduction. Uh, Lisa Proctor has been coming to the college church since she was baptized about a year ago. She spends a great deal of her time volunteering at the Maple House, which is a Church of Christ outreach in Searcy for the Poor and Homeless. What she loves most is cooking at the Maple House, and Lisa loves camping and spending time with her daughters and five grandchildren. So if you would, let's welcome Lisa this morning. As Lisa, I'll have to pull these up to see. She's here. Okay, we welcome Lisa uh, to being a part of our family. Uh, scripture tells us to rejoice with those who rejoice and to mourn with those who mourn. And this morning we mourn uh, with uh, the family of Opal Reynolds mother of Sharon Manor, passed away Friday, November 19th, and services are pending. So let's continue to remember the Manor and the Reynolds family uh, in our prayers. The annual area-wide Thanksgiving singing will be this Wednesday, November 24th at 7 o'clock at the Westside Church of Christ. The 4 o'clock early birds and all 7 p.m. Bible classes will be dismissed uh, that evening. And just a reminder that the church office will be closed Next week, Wednesday, November 24th through Friday, November 26th for Thanksgiving. And there will not be a bulletin next Sunday. So, thank you. Good morning. I just wanted to give you a quick update um, regarding the holiday gift outreach. Uh, last su Saturday, as you know, was our kickoff event with the Coke Drive. 
And with your generosity and giving, we were able to give out over 300 coats to those from our community that were in need. Um, and for the next three Sundays, there will be a table out in the four year um, after Bible class and before Bible class for any uh, interested in adopting families for the uh, holiday Christmas giving outreach. Um, for those that aren't able to participate actively, of course, we will happily accept any kind of donations that you would like to drop off if you prefer in that way. Um, again, thank you for your selfless giving and your support in this ministry that we can impact families around our community. Thank you. For the past few weeks, you may have noticed that there were several announcements about men being appointed to serve as deacons. In 2015, the elders approved a different process for uh, deacons to be appointed. Rather than waiting several years and having a large group of deacons nominated at once, the elders decided that when a need arises, deacons should be appointed to meet that need in a timely way. The elders believe that this process gives a better understanding of each deacon's responsibility and it more effectively fulfills the congregational needs. As the pandemic wanes and the congregation reevaluates and reactivates ministries, the need for new deacons has become apparent. And that is the reason for the frequent announcements of new deacons assuming leadership position in our ministries. And on that note, on behalf of the elders, I am pleased to report that there are three new nominations to serve as deacons for College Church. Dave Doughty is nominated to serve in the worship ministry. Dave grew up in this church, the son of Larry and Mary Lou, and has been a member for 36 years. He and his wife, Carrie, have two children, Ian and Ashley. Dave is serving as, in, as sound operator and in the live streaming ministry. Dave, if you're here, would you stand please so that we could see you? Dave Dottie, over this way. <laughs> Pat Howe is nominated to serve in the benevolence ministry. Pat and his wife, Joe have been members, excuse me, Scott Hearn, I'm sorry, I skipped the paragraph. Scott Hearn is nominated to serve in the Caring and Sharing Ministry. Scott and his wife, Laura, have been members of the College Church for 28 years. They have three children, son Jonathan, whose wife is Audrey, and their son is Nathan, uh, daughter Elizabeth Hawkins, and son Andrew. While at College Church, Scott has served in Caring and Sharing and Children's Ministry, assisting in the first grade class. Scott, are you here? Scott's right back there. <laughs> Thirdly, we have Pat Howe, who is nominated to serve in the Benevolence Ministry. Pat and his wife, Joe have been members of College Church for 15 years. They have four children, Brian, Ben, Jennifer Jobes, and Cindy Isom. While at College Church, Pat has served at his house and on the Abundant Living Ministry. Pat? Are you here? I thought I saw Pat. Okay. All right. Following these nominations, if any of you know of a scriptural reason that these men, any of these men should not serve as deacon, please submit the reason in writing to Charles Gaines, Chair of the Elders, within the next two weeks. The elders are very grateful to these men for their willingness to serve their church family in these important roles. To Canaan's land I'm on my way.
shame on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so pleasure in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. with thanksgiving in my heart. I will Good morning. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Dear Father, we are so thankful for this day. It is so great to be together with brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, we are so thankful for all those who serve on a daily and weekly basis here at College Church. And Father, we thank you for these men that have been appointed. And uh, we pray for them. And we also pray for all the deacons and the elders here at College Church and the work that they do. Father, we thank you for the staff. We thank you for the ministry staff. And we appreciate them so very much. We thank you for putting them into our lives. Father, we thank you for those who are leading today in prayer and song and worship. It's wonderful to be at a congregation where there's so much talent, and it's just great to be here today. Father, we pray for this church. We pray for the ministries that it does, all the many things that happen here every week, and the outreach to the world. Father, we pray that that will be fruitful, and um, that many lives will be changed because of it. Father, we pray for our children. We pray that they are raised in wonderful Christian families. We pray that they will learn about you and that they will grow up in your admonition. Father, we pray when they go to school that they can be the leaders and not the followers that they can show Christ living in their lives, and that they can change lives at the schools where they, where they attend. Father, there is so much evil in this world, and we pray that you will protect us all from it. Father, help us to have the wisdom to follow you in everything we do. In your son's name we pray, amen. There is a Redeemer.
We're approaching a time of year when giving thanks is certainly on our minds. And even though I suppose we could all produce a lengthy list of concerns that we face in this country today, we certainly have many reasons to give thanks as well. And I'm grateful for the time of year that we call Thanksgiving. As we prepare to take the Lord's Supper this morning, let us remember that gratitude is an integral part of the communion meal. Some have even referred to it as the Eucharist, which has roots in a Greek word that means gratitude or thanksgiving. When Jesus was with his disciples at the Last, Supper, the last Passover, uh, he instituted the Lord's Supper, and in Matthew 26, 26 from the NIV, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. Let's pray. Father, we give thanks this morning for the bread which represents the body of Christ that was broken for us on the cross. We have so many things to be thankful for. And this time we're especially grateful that you loved us so much that you were willing to sacrifice your son so that we could have forgiveness of sins. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Now I would call your attention to the thanksgiving that we find in the partaking of the fruit of the vine just one verse later, beginning in Matthew 26, 27. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on, until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we continue to express our thanks to you for the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood of your Son that was shed on the cross on our behalf. We also are grateful to be a part of your kingdom and honored to know that Jesus partakes with us because of that. We offer our thanks. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. An attitude of thankfulness is not only a part of the Lord's Supper prayer, of course, it needs to be a way of life. And one of the tangible ways that we can express our gratitude to God for the many things that he has blessed us with, he has given us an opportunity to give something back to him as an offering on the first day of the week. You can choose from a multiple of ways to do that, but as we reflect on our giving, let's be reminded that 1 Thessalonians 5.18 admonishes us to in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Dear God, we offer back to you a portion of our material blessings to be used in the furtherance of your kingdom. 
May we do so with thankful and joyful hearts. We are blessed and we are grateful. Help us to be good stewards of all that we have, knowing that every good thing we have comes from you and belongs to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I will be reading from Psalm 100, verses 1 through 5. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. For those involved with children's worship, you can head that direction uh, as we sing this next song before the sermon. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks. excited about these men that have been chosen to serve as deacons. They've been serving. We're just now giving them an official uh, capacity to do much of that, but they, they're not men who have been sitting around and we're looking for something for them to do. They have been working and serving this congregation because this congregation, now that we are surely coming back from COVID, we're not a digital church. We're not an on-the-couch church. We're an engaging church. We're an active serving church. There's some things that, that uh, now that we're uh, getting a little closer to full speed, there's some things that have been going on, some th things that still need to happen, and we need servants like these men. I appreciate Alan's, um, uh, his willingness to serve. He has now been appointed. We have six men who are being considered right now. In fact, that day is today. If you uh, know of any reason that they shouldn't serve, today's the, the deadline, on, on, deadline on that. Three more have been added to that list today, so ten new servants, new deacons for this church. I'm excited about that, which means that this church is growing active, it's living, it is serving God in all the ways that we need to be doing that. So keep them in your prayers. I'm, uh, I am grateful for the uh, okay job that Will has done leading our... <laughs> well, I mean, ser no, seriously, I mean, there was that one song that he pitched a little bit off and it it took us a while, didn't it? It took us a little while to get, get on there. And then uh, this last, this, the song right before I got up was a little slow. <laughs> no preacher wants to get up behind a slow song. And, and of course, the, um, the opening prayer, 
might have been a tad long, don't you think? I'm not making anybody feel uncomfortable, am I? Isn't this what you do at lunch? I mean, <laughs> I'm just doing it now in public. It's, it's okay to critique us in private, just don't do it public, right? Well, I hope you know my heart enough to know that I would never criticize someone in that way publicly without talking to them first and I asked their permission if I'd have got around to Byron I would have said something about the communion uh, Byron but actually this congregation uh, Sunday after Sunday is led by men who are extremely gifted and talented and today has been no exception will and the prayer was right on target Morris thank you thank you for leading us the way you have because it really should be the most natural thing for Christians to give praise and to be thankful and to give compliments rather than critique. It ought to be the most natural things for us to give words of praise and love and appreciation, especially as we've done this morning, as we have praised God. You know, the scripture reading just a moment ago from Psalms 100 said, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. If you have the NIV Bible, it says, shout for joy. Boy, if we were to do that this morning, someone said, nah, nah, we don't do that. I mean, what does it mean to make a joyful noise? Woo! When's the last time you heard that in church, David? Woo! Would we be offended if someone truly made a joyful noise as we worship God? Or if they were to shout for joy, maybe those are some things that we need to now also understand that when we come together to worship a holy and almighty God, sometimes it is very appropriate that all the earth remains silent because the Lord is in his holy temple. But there's sometimes in our life when when we are truly cognizant of what God has done for us and in our lives, that we ought to be willing and ready and, and maybe even able to shout for joy because of all that God has done. It ought to be natural for us. It should be easy for us to give words of praise and love and adoration and gratitude, giving our praise to God who has blessed us. I don't know why it is. But it seems that the natural thing for many of us to do, me included, that when things are not just right, it seems more natural for us to critique, to complain, or to criticize. When things are not just the way we want them to be. Did you pick up your communion this morning? Did you miss the good communion? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, don't you? You know, with this shortage of supply, it's been difficult for Nick to get the good communion to us. We're using the, the, the kind that's a little hard to open. It's, in fact, we've got lots of little spots on our carpet because they're, they're hard to open. And sometimes you open it and then it kind of goes everywhere. Uh, Lord willing, we'll have uh, the good stuff next week. But So what was your attitude when you picked it up this morning? Don't raise your hands. Don't speak out. <laughs> what did you think when you... When you, when you picked up the Lord's Supper this morning that represents the body of Christ that was broken for you, that represents the blood of Christ that was spilled for you, did you critique it? Did you criticize any? Well, where's the good stuff? It ought to be the most natural thing for Christians, especially at a time when we come together for what we call communion, the Lord's Supper, as Byron rightly pointed out this morning, sometimes some face call it the Eucharist, which means to, it's the verb of the Greek word that means to give thanks. So is that what we did? I mean, is that what we really did? Did we give thanks when we thought of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, his son? Did we give thanks with a joyful heart. The reason I say joyful this morning is because I find it nearly impossible in my life to give thanks if I don't have reason for joy. 
If I'm focused on what's not right, what isn't just right, when I'm focused on what things don't please me personally, it's hard for me to be grateful because I don't have that joy in my heart the way it should be. Maybe we need to heed Paul's instructions in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and I think he's writing, he could be writing to the 21st century church easily as much as he does to the 1st century church when he says, as for the rich in this present age. Now, make no, no mistake, I've seen the parking lot. We're doing okay in this congregation. We fall into this category. Much of the world would, would appreciate having just some of what you and I have in our lives. As for the rich in this present age, charge them, instruct them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on uncertainty of riches, but on God. God who richly provides us with everything to feel guilty about. That's not what it says, is it? God blesses us so we can enjoy them that we can live with them, that we can share them. I know that because he says they are to do good. He reminds us three things that we need to do with the wealth and the riches that God supplies in our life. We are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share with others, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. We need to listen to this warning. Those of us who have been made rich in this present age, we need to take what God has blessed us with and do good with it. To be generous, to share that wealth with others who may have less than we do, or to share in such a way that they might be led to know and appreciate and love the gospel the way that we do and to love the Lord the way we do. We need to be careful that we don't let the things that are going on and given to us in our life become thieves that rob us of the joyful heart that is necessary if, we are, if we're going to be a people who give thanks. Now let's talk about a few of those thieves that can rob us of our joy. Maybe it's the thief of having way too much. A lot of our homes, we've got closets we can hardly shut, drawers that won't shut, Maybe some of us have so many things and stuff in our lives that we have a storage building somewhere to, to, so we can put all the stuff that won't fit in our house. We put it somewhere else. We've got a whole lot of stuff, don't we? And sometimes the thief that can rob us of our real joy is when we have way too much. Because when we have way too much, we tend to expect or to demand. You would think that the more that we have the more grateful we would be. But often is the case, the more stuff we have, the more we expect to be given even more, to have more, to purchase more. We might even demand more from others. And when you suffer from having way too much, you might also forget who is the source of every good and perfect blessing. Now, I know, I know. You earn that degree that you have, and you work really, really hard in your career. I understand that. And you've made some very good financial decisions. You may have even done without years and years ago so that you have more than plenty today. You may have made all the right financial decisions, but God is still worthy of all the praise and adoration that you can give him because he's the one that blessed you with that good mind, those strong arms, those opportunities and the ability to make a living the way you have. He is deserving of all the praise that we can give him. And then, then we need to talk about the thief of taking God's blessings for granted. This is probably where I fall. Uh, this is the category where I fall into most of all, taking God's blessings for granted. And the way it happens is we are surrounded by so much. I mean, I walk into my house and there's luxuries and conveniences. There's beauty. Every, I mean, there's everywhere I, I look in my house, there are good things that God has placed in my life. And I ought to be able to give him thanks for just about anything like water. 
You know, we, it's, it's an abundance. We, we just go to the sink, we turn that little knob or pull that little lever, and voila, there's water. Cool, clear water. Thank you. Sons of the Pioneer fans right there. <laughs> when is the last time you had a glass of water in your hand and said, God, I thank you for good, clear water. You do know that a great majority of the world doesn't have access to a cool, clear glass of water the way you and I do. But what about when, when those things that we're accustomed to having in our lives all the time, when they're taken away, maybe they're doing construction out in the street and they cut off the water for a while. Hey, who cut off my water? Or maybe someone used up all the hot water right before you jump in the shower. Hey, who used all the hot water this morning? And all of a sudden, what should have brought joy to our lives, because it's not there exactly when and how we want it to be, it seems so quick for us sometimes to be critical and to complain. God says we need to not take those for granted and to give him thanks. An unknown author, author said this, a hungry man is more thankful for his small morsel than a rich man for his heavy laden table. A lonely woman in a nursing home will appreciate a visit far more than a popular woman with a party thrown in her honor. Or a Russian who finally receives his own copy of the Holy Scriptures after 75 years of state-imposed atheism is more thankful for his little Bible then sometimes we are for all the Christian books and magazines and translations that overflow our shelves. It's easy to take God's blessings for granted, and it robs us of our joy when we do. But there's also the thief of never being satisfied. Go with me back to the children of Israel. They've spent hundreds of years in slavery in Egypt, but God listens to their prayers. He sends a delivery, sends those plagues. Now he leads them out of Egypt. He takes them and leads them through the Red Sea. He swallows up the Egyptian army in that Red Sea so that the children of Israel never again ever have to fear Egypt. Three days later. Okay, now they're, in, they're there in the wilderness still. And they've just come through the Red Sea. In Exodus chapter 15, they sing a song of praise to God. 18 verses this song is. You think just as I am is long. 18 verses. They're singing this song in praise to God. But then just three days later, in Exodus chapter 16, there's a shortage of water. And all of a sudden, the complaining and the griping that, that becomes accustomed to them, it starts happening. Who brought us out here in the wilderness? We had it better in Egypt. All you did, Moses, was bring us out here into the wilderness to die of thirst. One chapter before, they were singing. Their, they couldn't sing enough praise to God. And now they're griping and whining and complaining. That's because they're not satisfied. For the next 40 years, these people will never really be content and satisfied. And they are, God is going to keep providing for them. Manna is going to come right on schedule, and they're going to complain about that. They are not going to see God as the one who provides all the blessings. That's our culture. We're a culture that's not satisfied. We're never really content. Enough is never really enough. That's why you and I, from time to time, we need to sing the song, Count Your Many Blessings. Name them one by one. Because if our life doesn't remember the good that God has given to us, it robs us of our joy. You think there's a correlation between thankfulness and faithfulness? I think if you look at the children of Israel, you will see that there really is. 
Do you think there is a correlation between joy and thankfulness? Absolutely. There are benefits to having a joyful spirit. There are some rich benefits. One is that people who freely and gladly and generously give gratitude and thanksgiving, they are generally just happier people, happier people, and more likable people. Do I really need to state the obvious for us? That if there's someone that, that's, that's in our presence, maybe they're in the room with us, and, and they are just griping and complaining and yammering about this or that and that, and they just never stop complaining. They're just griping about something all the time that when they get up and leave the room, no one ever says, well, I sure wish they didn't leave so soon. I sure hate to see them go. The truth is, when you're in the presence of a complainer, you can't wait until they're gone because they're not much fun and they're not happy people. But people who gladly and freely and generously give praise and thanksgiving, they're wonderful to be around. They're a pleasure to be around. In fact, they kind of want to draw that same sort of attitude out of each one of us. And it's, it's not that their circumstances are all that much different. People with a good attitude, people with a joyful heart, they have the same problems. Their doctors give them the same diagnoses. They have the same financial issues that all of the rest of us do. They're not problem-free people. They just remember who is the giver of the good blessings that they still have. Now, if there's anyone that ever experienced hardship and trouble and suffering and imprisonment, it was the Apostle Paul. But yet, he is the one in Philippians chapter 4 wrote these words. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned that in whatever situation I am, I'm satisfied, I'm content, enough is enough. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need, and I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You know, we quote that verse, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, and we talk about, all, no, you can't. I can't, I, as much as I want to believe that verse, I have yet to dunk a basketball. Can you? You can't either? Oh, I was sure you could, Will. I can't do it. But that's not what that verse is about. That verse is you can do all the things that God calls you to do, like be content, be satisfied. God will give you the strength if you'll trust him, if you'll believe him, if you will be thankful to him. Enough will be enough. And I've discovered that true joy has very little to do with what you have or don't have. It has almost nothing to do with how much you have or how little you have. True joy has everything to do with how thankful for you are, that you are for what you do have. Do you want to be a happier person? That's not even the way to say it. Do you want others around you to be happier than possess a thankful spirit. Be willing to express your thankfulness to people in your life. Your spouse will be happier for it. Your kids will be happier. Your parents will be happier. Your neighbors, your co-workers, everyone that is in your life. If you're a happier person, a, a more thankful person, I promise you they will seem happier around you. Even in the dark times. Even when you do have problems and suffering, look for the ways to count your blessings. God has provided all of us with copious reasons to count our many blessings. Second benefit. One expert tells us that possessing a spirit of thankfulness reduces stress in our life. And you're probably wondering, now who is this expert who says that being thankful will reduce stress in life? Well, I think it's the Apostle Paul once again. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, 
with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You know, you and I live in a country that is probably blessed with as much stuff as any nation probably has ever seen. And we live in a culture where people are, are seem like they're always wanting more and more. And enough is never enough. And they're never really satisfied. And, and yet we are a nation that is filled with a lot of people who are overstressed. Hmm. Kind of makes you wonder, is there a correlation between discontentment and stress? I think there may be. And another benefit is your praise and your worship to God is more pleasing and acceptable to God. I'm going to let that sink in just for a moment because I said something that you need to really hear. Our praise and our worship to God is more pleasing and acceptable to God. I want you to imagine this scenario all week long for whatever reason things just haven't gone your way and you've just griped about this and you complained about that and the temperature this or the food that and and nothing has really been all that pleasing to you and you just sort of griped and whined most of the week you even got up Sunday morning where are my clothes I can't find my favorite shirt where where is that the and the the eggs are a little too runny well I don't know what all you complain about on Sunday we complain about a lot of things and then we come into church after a week long after a morning long of complaining about this and that and everything that we that just isn't just so so in our life we come in here and we put a slap a smile on our face and we just give thanks with a grateful heart give thanks and God in heaven might look at some of us and go really I listen to you most of the week you can't talk like that all week long and come in here and to think that you can just correct all of that with a simple song. Psalm chapter 50, there's an interesting verse in verse 23 where the psalmist says, The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To the one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. Do you know what God, I think, wants more from us than anything else? It's not necessarily our singing or our praying, or our offerings. I think what God would love for us all week long are the sacrifices of thanksgiving. He doesn't want to listen to our whining and complaining. He heard enough of that 40 years in the wilderness with the Israelites. He doesn't need that anymore from his people. Thanksgiving. And then one more benefit. A spirit of thankfulness motivates, it even prompts God to give more blessing. You see, there's something about receiving, always consuming and never saying thank you that just makes you raise your eyebrows. You parents see that once in a while, don't you? Maybe you, you give some gift and, and you took great... Um, you went to great lengths to choose just the right gift or, or whatever it is and, and um, you give a gift to a child and the child goes, oh... Well, this isn't exactly what I wanted. I wanted a different color. I was hoping to get more than this. How does that make you feel as the giver of a gift when it wasn't good enough? It kind of makes you want, well, I kind of now wish I hadn't given you anything. But what if that same kid had a spirit of joyfulness? Oh, thank you, thank you. I never dreamed I would ever receive something so wonderful. It's just right. It's better than I would have ever imagined. Thank you, thank you. And they just, they just burst out with thanksgiving. And they're so humble in what they have been given. How does it make you feel? Well, I kind of want to give this kid more. He or she truly appreciates all that has been done for them and given to them. I think God is the same way. I think when we genuinely have a heart of thanksgiving and we praise him for being the giver of every good gift, I think it motivates his heart to want to bless our lives even more. If, you, uh, if you're with us on Sunday nights, 
last Sunday night and tonight, Lord willing, we're, we're looking at Psalms 103. And verses 1 and 2, I didn't say a whole lot about that last week in the Sunday night lesson uh, because I also wanted to say something about it this morning. But uh, come back tonight and we'll finish the rest of Psalms 103. Verse 1 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. When I read that, it means that there's not much left in my life. There's no room left in my life for whining, griping, and complaining. Not if, when, if all that is within me bless his holy name, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his blessings. All of those gifts that have been directed my way. The rest of the psalm begins to go on to enumerate all of those many blessings. He gives the forgiveness of our transgressions. He heals our diseases. He redeems our soul from death. He crowns us with steadfast love and mercy. He satisfies us with good. I mean, God just lavishes us with this gift and that blessing and, and more blessing. How wonderful it is to know that the creator of the universe knows who you are, adores you, crowns you, loves you, satisfies you. How wonderful to know that the creator of all things is taking care of you. Give thanks. And how wonderful it is to know in the midst of all of these blessings that every single sin that I have ever committed in my life, that I will ever one day commit in my life, every sin is forgiven. Verse 12 of, of this same chapter says, as far away as the east, I'm sorry, I got critiqued about this last week, didn't I, Harold? As far away as the east is from the west. God has taken your sins and he's removed your transgressions away from you as far away as that. That is reason for us to give. Even when things aren't going exactly as we want, even when things aren't exactly the, the way we wish they were, even when we're going through trouble and dark times, knowing east and west, knowing that my sins are that far away from me, I always have reason to praise the God who loves me, adores me, and blesses me. And how wonderful it is to know I'm a part of a really, really good church. Now, I did not say a perfect church. We are far from perfect. But we are a wonderfully good church. We love one another and we love the world and we, we share what we have in order that they might know the Savior that we know. And I'm blessed to be a part of a great and wonderful church. And I always, because of you, I always have reason to be thankful. Maybe you're looking for a church home. If you're online with us, maybe you're here this morning and you're searching for a church home. Again, we're not a perfect church, but we are a very good church that tries to do things Three things. We try to do good. We try to be generous in what we're doing good. And we try to be generous with, with others and with a world that needs to know Jesus Christ. We don't take our blessings for granted. We share them with others. We're, we're blessed to have a really good church family. Maybe you'd like to be a part of this church family. All you have to do is let me or one of the elders know. Go online. It's the easiest way to do it. Just go online and check that little box. I, I desire to place membership and we'll get back with you. I promise you. You connect with us, we'll connect with you. But it could be you want some prayer this morning. We can pray for you and help you in whatever spiritual need that you have. But if you want to become a child of God, you want to know that your, your sins, as far as the east is from the west, your sins are forgiven, then put your faith in Christ. Be immersed in the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. If we can help you with any need like that, please come while Will leads us in this song. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my
that was an okay job. <laughs> no, that was a great job, Noel. I, I, I think we all appreciate that and are thankful for your message this morning and especially this week in this time. I'm really thankful and I think the elders are humbled and thankful for this congregation and the way that uh, you do serve one another and uh, you serve those outside the congregation. Uh, when we ask those that want, would like to serve as deacons, sometimes they say, well, do I have to do that? I, I, I may, I, can I continue to serve in this capacity I'm doing? Do I, you know, do I have to take a commitment of that? No. no you, you continue to serve, but we just wanted to acknowledge that. And sometimes that's some of those answers we get back. But we have so many that serve in, in the Bible classes and in so many areas around it's, it's, it's hard to thank all of you at once, but I'm thanking you now from the, from the elders. You do a marvelous job, and you look for ways to serve, and uh, you bless us with that. And, um, and this week, we certainly want to be thankful to you for that. We're certainly thankful for to God for giving us those talents and abilities, and may we use them and multiply them for God. Let's pray. Father, once again, we thank you, Father, for giving us your son and leaving your spirit until the work is done as was mentioned in the earlier song father help us to be content with what you have blessed us with help us to have a joyful heart as what noel discussed this morning from your scriptures help us to have the peace of god from the blessings that you bless us with and we ask you to forgive us for not being thankful at times Help us to be those around that those uh, help us to do those things that uh, help people to be around us and that want to follow those things. And we know that we can do that when we follow the example of your son. Father, we are grateful and pr we pray that we can show that and display that to you and to those around us that we are dependent upon you for so many things spiritually, physically and emotionally. And, Father, we just know that you'll continue to watch over us and take care of us. Again, we ask you to bless this congregation, bless your church, and use us. In Jesus' name, amen.